We're going to have our communion of the bread and cup this evening. And as an encouragement to understand the full atonement, we want tonight to encourage your heart in some truths about divine healing. Mainly, I want to center our thoughts around the question, is Satan stealing your healing? Well, he is stealing the healing of most people. I'm talking about most in the churches. Now, according to Isaiah 53, healing is in the atonement. We know that here because we've studied it from the Hebrew, where we're told that he carried away our diseases and our pains, as well as our sins. With healing in the atonement, then it's a question of whether or not we're willing to believe God and appropriate it. Now, while we recognize the devil doesn't have to steal what the church rejects, since it wants nothing to do with divine healing, that is, faith in God alone for healing, telling us it's not for today, that God heals today through medical science, the new drugs that have been discovered, and so on. Yet, for those of us who don't want to experience any longer the pain and mutilation of surgery, and I've had my share of that, I know what it is. Those of us who don't want any more of that, that mutilation and pain and pollution of our bodies with all kinds of drugs that we don't know what's happening inside and the effects you'll get later, because even the aspirin causes adverse side effects. For those of us who don't want to go through that any longer, then there are ways to keep the devil from stealing your healing. Now, one of the blessings that God is restoring to at least the charismatic church, for those who will believe it, is the truth of divine healing today and this great outpouring of the Spirit. And certainly it needs to be restored because when the church long ago lost the experience of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it lost both its faith and power to heal the sick. It couldn't heal itself, so how can it heal anyone else? And I suppose at least one of the greatest questions or problems confronting the human race is how to obtain healing or to maintain your health if you are well, happen to catch yourself well along the way. Billions of dollars are being spent on drugs, doctors, hospitals, healing, and for all that, they're fighting a losing battle. That's why you would think the church of all places would welcome divine help, because with all the billions and efforts energy they're expending, they're fighting a losing battle. And yet the church, just like the unbelieving world, wants nothing to do with calling the elders. Not if there's a doctor around they can call. Just like the world, they turn to man for help. And so, because of the state of unbelief that the church finds itself in today, then it has been forced to develop a theology of divine sickness. Instead of the Word of God, believing that, divine healing. But as I say, for those of us who don't want any more of the mutilation and pain and pollution with drugs and medicines, there are ways to keep the devil from stealing your healing. Now, he will steal it if he can from you. You can sit right here in faith assembly and lose your healing or allow the devil to steal it. And so we have to keep encouraging one another in the scriptural teaching concerning divine healing. Now, one way not to lose it, not to release it to the devil, your healing or the faith for it, is... Believe what the Word of God teaches about divine healing instead of the Word of man concerning divine sickness. Now that first point is not necessarily new to you, but you need to keep reminding yourself that Satan is always assaulting you, your mind that is, with what man has to say, his logic, his intellect. I talked to someone recently that without salvation, without the baptism of the Holy Spirit, there was no way really to explain The foolishness of trusting God and saying you're healed, it just isn't manifested yet when all they can see is the symptoms or the fact you're not healed. And so, of course, the devil is always assaulting your mind with the illogical position that you have when you, you know, trust in Mark 11, 24, for example. You are to believe you're healed when you pray, not when you feel better, but when you pray, then you shall have it. Now, how do you explain that to a non-believer or a non-charismatic even? And so he assaults your mind with the logic of man's positions on healing or whatever, telling you, why don't you stay with a little bit of logic or common sense in this thing? We have to be willing to stay with God's word on divine healing, not man's word on divine sickness. That God sends sickness, you know, for his glory and our good. 
And if you follow that to its logical conclusion, then they ought to be praying to be sick. They should be praying that God would send the whole family some form of disease or infirmity so they could really glorify God. Of course, their immediate reply would be, well, that's a terrible thought. Certainly it is. But the sickness theology of the church today is sick. I mean, that's where it will leave you in a corner like that. And so if you get into the Word of God, you'll find certain facts that are quite logical. Like, first of all, that sickness, just like sin, entered the world through man's fall. Now, that's the first thing you have to establish yourself in, that sickness came in with sin. You see that in Genesis 2 and 3. God told Adam if he disobeyed him, then as dust he would return to the dust. In other words, he would die. Now, sickness is just a form of death. You get sick enough, you die. And people get progressively sicker, and so they're happy if they can make it to their Social Security check. Get the first one before they have to go off and meet whoever they're going to meet. We have to see that sickness is a part of the curse. It came with the fall. Deuteronomy 28 tells you sickness and death and other adversities are a part of the curse. And of course, Galatians 3 tells us the Christian is not under that curse. Then the second thing the Word of God will show you, if you'll stay with His Word and not man's Word, is that the atonement went as deep as man's need. The atonement went as deep as the fall. And so that means man needs both Physical and spiritual healing. That's why Isaiah, I referred to it previously, Isaiah tells you that the atonement went as deep as man's knee. For God said this. Isaiah didn't say it. I didn't say it. God said it. That he will bear away our diseases and carry away our pains and with his stripes will be healed. And he also bears away our sins. In other words, he redeemed the whole man. Isaiah 53, then you read Matthew 8, 16 and 17 and you'll see that Matthew quotes Isaiah, pointing to that promise, and said when Jesus was healing the sick, he was referring or fulfilling, not fulfillment, but fulfilling that prophecy about him, that he would bear away our sicknesses and carry away our pains as well as bear away our sins. Now, the third thing we need to see is that the message of healing that Jesus commissioned the church with was an inseparable part of of the gospel that he commissioned to the church. You notice every time in the gospels when he sends the disciples, like the 70 or the 12 apostles forth to preach, he said, go preach the gospel and heal the sick. He never separated those two things. And then before he is to ascend into heaven, he commissions the church in Mark 16. He said, go preach the gospel to every creature and these signs will follow them that believe it. In my name, they can lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. See, it's right in the commission he gave us. And then, fourthly, you get into the word of God and not man's word, you'll find that God has said he set healing in the church. 1 Corinthians twelve twenty-eight. He said in firstly apostles, prophets, teachers, gifts of healing, miracles, tongues. These are gifts set in the church. James 5, call for the elders of the church, not the doctor. See, it's in the church. Now, the institutional church tells us, of course, the age of miracles and healing is past. Well, then I'd like for you to tell me what age we're living in. We're certainly not living in the Old Testament age, Old Testament dispensation. That's past. We're not in the millennium. That's future. So to ask the question really is to answer it. What age are we living in? The church age, the one that God's word says we're in. And he says, in that age, I set the gifts of healing in the church. We won't need them in the millennium. We can't do anything about the past. That's already past. So he said, I set the gifts of healing in the church age. He didn't say the first century church. Where did he say that? That's what manology will tell you. But that isn't what God said. So in spite of the unbelief of institutional religion, it isn't going to change the fact that thousands and thousands have been and are being healed where they're willing to believe God's word of divine healing and set aside man's teaching on divine sickness. Now, the devil just loves to hear the church of our day teach its theology of sickness and tell us that healing is past because he knows sickness is for the present. Because, you see, people are still getting sick, and so he can just keep laying it on them with that confession. As long as they confess that healing is past, and he knows sickness is for the present, they don't have a chance. You know, not only healing is past, but the age of miracles is past. Well, if it has, then no one can ever be saved again. Because the greatest miracle, greatest miracle is the new birth. If you don't know about that, you need to read Mark chapter 2, where Jesus clearly teaches there that spiritual healing takes a greater miracle than physical healing. Now, if you'll read Mark 2, the first few verses, you'll see that that is his thrust there. 
And so the age of miracles and healing is not past because the age of needing these things is not past. Institutional religion tells us that some things are past that some of us are experiencing in the present, so I don't know what to do with it. If God's going to bless me and gives me a blessing, then why should I believe the word of man when I'm experiencing what he promises when I exercise faith in it? So which are you going to believe, the word of man that says this isn't for today when you've already got it, or believe your experience? Like the young man that came to me and said, my Greek teacher over at college, by the way, he had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I believe he was even saved through the church, but I know he received the baptism and he came with some arguments on a piece of paper. He said, my Greek teacher shows me that I can't speak in tongues. It's not for today. I said, did you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit in this church? Yes. I said, did you get the initial evidence of new tongues? I prayed for him. I know he did. I said, did you speak in new tongues? He said, I did. Well, then I said, who are you going to believe? Your Greek teacher who doesn't have the experience or believe the word of God and you do have the experience. Well, he said, that's right. I guess I better believe what God has said since I've received it or they could talk me out of my salvation. I said, yes, and they will. So which are you going to believe, man's word or God's word? We said, how to keep the devil from stealing your healing is to establish yourself in what God has said about it, about the sickness healing question. Secondly, after you know what God has had to say about it, and a lot of people don't, then you need to guard your mind against the lies and deceptions of the devil because he will try to steal your healing through the thought realm. Now, he will try to implant doubts and fears and lies and deceptions in your mind if he can because he knows that if he can gain access here, he's won 50% of the battle and he knows you're going to defeat yourself and the other 50% with your doubts and fears. He doesn't have to do anything about the other 50%. People always defeat themselves. I've ministered with and to, and I've had people in line up here time and again that have defeated themselves. Well, the devil has told me that I'm probably not saved. And they're coming up here telling you what the devil is saying. You know, as if they can't really hear what they're saying to me. So they're already listening to the deceiver. They don't want to believe it. And they know I don't believe it. And God doesn't say it. And so the devil planted the thought in their mind. He won half the battle by doing that when they listened to him. And then they defeated themselves. And some are still defeating themselves on that question. Would you believe people are still coming up here? Not sure if they're saved. Now, I'm not talking about a person who wants to get saved and a person who has no assurance and has, if we can use the term, sincere doubts. You know, they're just not sure that they've had anything but a religious experience. But I'm talking about after going through all of this, then all of a sudden let the devil implant thought in their heart. Like one fellow said recently, I had three points in the sermon. If you want to see God, that's what we were talking about. You have to have a right attitude through your trials. And secondly, you have to live a life of holiness and peace. For without peace and holiness, no man shall see God. And the third, assurance that you would see God is faith. And when I got to the faith point, we lost him there. And the devil moved right in and said, well, you don't have faith for salvation. So I had to go through all that trip again with him. I can't help if that embarrasses some of you. And I started out the sermon. By saying, here are some assurances of your endurance. Here's how I can assure your endurance. And I started out by saying, God said it through me, that these admonitions for you to endure to the end, like Matthew 24, he that endures to the end will be saved. Let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. I said, those admonitions to endure are not given by God to produce fear in your heart, but faith. And not to get you to question your salvation, but to make your calling and election sure. See, I can remember my sermons. I hope you do. And here he was. He said, I was all right till I got to the faith point. And the devil talked him out of his salvation. Went through all of that. Had to spend five, ten minutes there. Trying to tell him, you've got to stand somewhere, brother. You've got to stand somewhere. Get it settled. Now, I'm not talking about a person who needs to get saved. I'm not talking about a person, as I've said, who has some genuine doubts and they need to straighten that out. But to sit out there Sunday after Sunday and then all of a sudden not be sure you're saved doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. I mean, falling into the devil's snare... 
even when we warn you that God doesn't admonish you this way as his child to put fear in your heart but faith and not to get you to question am I saved but for you to make your calling and election sure I don't sit around and question whether or not I'm saved and I have the same trials and probably more than most of you it doesn't occur to me to doubt my salvation Oh, he's tried to implant that thought like 10,000 others in your mind. But you just don't accept them because he's won 50% of the battle when you listen to him. And I refuse to listen to that liar and deceiver. That's what Jesus said he was. Now, I've said all that to help all of you because I've had somebody else watching my house for a week. We've been broken in twice in less than a year. Then the neighbor says, there's somebody hovering around your house back and forth in a green car and he walks back and forth and so we don't know if we're getting cased again. Is that the term they use? (laughs) Some of you may be more adept at the terminology. And so while the devil tries to implant fear, but we just didn't let it happen. Just go right on about your business like they're not there. And even I saw the car once, but I couldn't tell who it was. And then we come to find out it's somebody that's been up and down and back and forth. And to, I guess to every minister in the body, about his salvation. He just won't get to the place where he will take God at his word. You're not saved by feeling saved. You're saved because God says you are if you believe it. Then the assurance will come. I spent an hour with him. I've talked to him at least three times that I can remember. And every minister in the body takes him through a confession of faith. So get established in the Word. Whether it's about salvation or healing or whatever. If you let that doubt in your mind, then Satan has already won 50% of the battle and he knows you'll defeat yourself. You'll defeat yourself. The other 50% with your doubts and fears. And so Satan has many ways. He assaults your mind with doubts and fears and lies and deceptions, as I said. And he works... Basically, in three ways that I want to deal with tonight, or at least I'm going to deal with what I consider three basic ways. First of all, he works directly. And this way, he tries personally to implant the thoughts in your mind or his demons. But I mean, he's working directly. He's not working through people. You're going through a trial. You see, you've claimed your healing. It isn't manifested yet. And he'll say, don't you know that most churches... Teach that God heals today through medical science and all of these wonderful drugs that have been discovered. And are you going to be foolish enough to ignore all of these blessings and advancements of medical science and the drugs and so forth that help people? Are you going to ignore all of that and just trust by faith in the word of God alone for your healing? Don't you know people will call you a religious fanatic? All of these are his suggestions. If you haven't heard them, you haven't been sick. He said, don't you know that you can die from this condition? This is a good one that stops a lot of people and they listen to him. Do you think that all of these thousands of Christians, most of them, he will tell you, who go to doctors are wrong and you and your little old church is right? Oh, if that doesn't get you, it's because you're not listening to the devil. You know, you're in the minority. Why, certainly you are. If that doesn't convince you, then the devil will punctuate his point with a little jab of pain or stir up a symptom or let you see a spot of blood somewhere. And what he's trying to do now is to get you to trust in your feelings instead of faith. And here's where he defeats a lot of people because he will say, you still have your symptoms. Do you see that little spot of blood? Feel that jab of pain? That could be from anything. You know, maybe you forgot you planted flowers yesterday. Oh, that's a kidney problem. No, it's because, you know, you worked a muscle you hadn't been working for a while. But you don't think of those things often at that time. And so he will punctuate his point with a little stab of pain or a symptom, trying to get you to trust in your feelings. I've had people come and say, now, I've been prayed for for this particular condition, but I don't feel any better. And it's been so many weeks or months or days or whatever. Sometimes it's just last week. I don't feel any better or I don't see any change. It never occurs to people who go to doctors, and many who come for prayer do go to doctors, I mean in the charismatic meetings. They haven't cut off the earthly physician because they're just trying that maybe this will work because the doctors haven't, you know, brought a manifestation about or corrected it, so maybe divine healing will work. And so a lot of people who come in a healing line are still going to the doctors. This is just another method they're trying. But all of us, I guess most of us, if not all of us, 
have had the experience of going to the doctor. And those who go to doctors, and when we went to the doctor, it never occurred to us to say that to the doctor after surgery. You know, he comes in, you've just awakened from under the anesthetic, and he looks at you and you say, Doctor, I don't feel a bit better. No one ever felt any better after surgery. No, if you've ever had an operation, you never felt better. And some of the drugs make you feel worse that they give you. They'll make you sick. There was a pain medicine they used to try to give me, and it made me sicker than the operations. And all my trips to the hospital, I got to the place where I just endured the pain. I mean, without any medicine. And if you want to feel something that's not exactly nice, you ought to have an operation where they cut you half in two and take no pain medicine because the sickness, the nausea, is worse than the pain. Now, I've been through that. So what I'm saying is, it never occurred to me to ever say to the doctor that this medicine makes me sick, therefore it must not be any good. It's good for everybody, it just made me sick. And all drugs have some side effects. But it never occurs to people to stop taking their pills. It never occurs to them to stop trusting in the doctor. They can't wait to get back to him, even though he made them feel worse, made them feel terrible. And people do stop trusting in God, his word. And they stop taking his medicine, which is the word of God, Psalm 107.20. He sends his word and heals them. Now, a little secret that might help you understand why when it's divine healing, it's faith in God and not the pills, it's prayer and not the pills, is that faith healing will not work any more without faith than medical healing would work without medicine. If you're going to go that route, we're not talking about the adverse side effects of surgery and medicines and drugs, but you couldn't get healed the medical way without their medicines and their treatments. So you can't get healed God's way without his medicine, which is his word, Psalm 107.20. In other words, faith healing won't work without faith any more than medical healing would work without medicine. Then another method he's got is to assault your mind with doubts. He will try to remind you that you've had some unanswered prayers in the past, and I guess everyone in here has had at least one experience where they didn't get a prayer answered. Whatever the reason is another question. They didn't meet some condition, we know that, but the point is, he will try to convince you this is going to be one of those times when you'll have another unanswered prayer. And so there's no use your exercising faith for healing, because this is chastisement, maybe. Maybe he will suggest that. And there's no use praying for God to deliver you from that because he's chastening you because of some form of this or that or other disobedience. And so you spend the next week or two trying to figure out what sin you're being chastened for. And in the meantime, he's stealing your healing when you ought to be releasing faith. Now, any other time when he suggests doubts in your mind like that, that this is a time when God won't answer your prayer or you can't expect him to answer, any other time you wouldn't have listened to him. With a little spot of blood or a jab of pain or a symptom, it can sound very convincing that you have to start examining your life all the way back to the time you got saved to see why you're being chastened, because he's suggesting that's what it is. And another thing that he assaults your mind with is fear, and of course that's his secret weapon, in case you haven't learned it. He defeats most people with that. When he can't defeat them with the other things, he will assault the mind with fear. He will say, don't you know this is serious? You remember sister so-and-so? He'll even call them sister and brother. Had your symptoms? They didn't make it. You remember you went to the funeral? They died. And that church you attend, they don't care whether you die or not. Aren't you being foolish to listen to them when most churches don't agree with them anyway? That they teach that the way God heals today is through medical science? Faith Assembly doesn't care if you die. Has he ever suggested that to anybody? Faith Assembly doesn't care if your child dies. They'll just go right on preaching anyway. It's no skin off their nose. And so he assaults your mind with fear. As I say, a little jab of pain or a spot of blood or a symptom about now will make a doubter out of many a believer. Fear will replace faith. This is his secret weapon because the devil hates faith. And that's why he uses fear to drive faith out of your heart. And if he can't get inside your mind, your thoughts, any other way, fear will generally do it, if you're not very careful. Now, you say, I already know that. Well, then, you are equipped doubly now to resist the devil when he tries to implant fear in your mind. A lot of people are defeated by fear because he does suggest this is serious. And if you don't treat it with medicine or go get a checkup or an x-ray or something, it could get so serious, even if you didn't die, you'd never get healed. Have you ever heard those arguments? Well, as I say, if you haven't, you haven't been sick. And so right about now is when you need to encourage your heart with Second Timothy 1, 7, which says, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of love, of power, and of a stable mind. 
Just quote him that. Now, those are some of the ways he works directly. We said, first of all, establish yourself in the word to keep the devil from stealing your healing. Secondly, guard your mind against his lies and deceptions because he works in the thought realm. He works directly. We just told you how in the thought realm. Now, while we rather hastily moved over that, we have taught on this fact so many times that you should not fall into the deception or snare of thinking it's unimportant because we didn't spend the whole hour on it. Because the people I have to deal with on the phone, in the mail, and who come for counseling are people who are not listening when we're telling them these things. And their problem is fear. They'll call the ambulance instead of calling on heaven. They'll call for help instead of saying, Hallelujah, praise the Lord for the trial, James 1. They're doing all the things that week after week we're laboring to show you not to do. Or we are showing you what you are to do and they're not doing those things. So because that we didn't spend an hour teaching you how Satan works directly in the mind doesn't mean that that isn't important because there's where he's defeating most people. But he also works indirectly. Now, not all of us would be affected adversely by what others say, but you want to get away from doubters. You want to get away from non-charismatics. You want to get away from unbelievers if you're going through a trial or your child or your wife or husband as quickly as possible because some can be defeated in this manner. He works indirectly through others. First of all, there are the obvious Job's friends that we all know about. We've met them. Sometimes you're married to them. Sometimes you work with them in the office. Sometimes they're sitting next to you in church. They're your friends. Job's friends. Satan's little helpers. When you're going through a trial who try to talk you out of the foolishness of your faith. Now, I just experienced a thing like that. It wasn't my trial, but where they were trying to get me to talk somebody else out of their faith because they were being foolish, you know, to this person that was concerned about their physical condition. And this person, you know, is walking it out by faith. And so Satan's little helpers, Job's friends, come armed with statistics to prove that you're in the minority in your view that God will heal you by faith alone in his promise. Now, that's what you have to know is that Job's friends don't come with a lot of futile arguments. They have derision. They have ridicule. They use vain arguments. They have all sorts of methods, plus the fact they come armed with their statistics to prove that you are being foolish and you are in the minority. So what else is new? Of course you're in the minority. Those who follow truth have always been in the minority, whether in the Old Testament, New Testament, down to the present. What's new about that? In fact, the principle is set forth in Matthew 7 where Jesus said that the way of truth is quite narrow and few find it. He said, broad is the way that leads to destruction. Now, he's talking about spiritual destruction, but the same principle will apply to physical destruction. So there's a principle there in Matthew 7, as there is like in Romans 10.10. You have to confess to possess something. Though he's talking about salvation, it's a faith principle that works for anything. So in Matthew 7, here's the faith principle concerning healing. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. This would be physical destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Most do in the churches. But narrow is the way that leads to life, whether it's spiritual or physical life, and few there be that find it. Yes, they will come armed with their proofs that you are in the minority, but what's new about that? That's what Jesus taught. The way of truth is narrow because man cannot add any of his ideas or opinions to it and have it remain truth. And the reason the broad way is so broad is because man just keeps adding his ideas, his opinions, his interpretation to the word of God, and it just gets broader and broader. The broad way that the people that follow them walk on. It gets so broad, it just includes everything. You know, from faith and presumption to faith teachers now telling us that God heals while you're on your medicine. The way of truth has always been there. What's new about that? And so when they try to convince you that you're in the minority, you agree with them because it is true. Now, Satan not only works through Job's friends, Satan's helpers, to talk you out of your faith, but he has other ways. I'm talking about working indirectly now. We said he worked directly in the mind, and here's ways he works indirectly. Not just through Job's friends, but some ways are supernatural. I've seen him work in supernatural ways to try to overthrow the faith of some. 
Like I have experienced on more than one occasion epileptic seizures right in the midst of a meeting. You're right in the middle of your sermon where you're proving from the Word of God the truth of divine healing and faith. And then a seizure, that spirit, that epileptic spirit throws them into a seizure. Well, the first time that happened, I was given my testimony. I was right in the middle of it. And it's a faith testimony. And so what we did, of course, that does kind of interrupt the meeting. We just went over and cast that spirit out. And I went back and started to give my testimony. And before I could get but a few words out, somebody tapped me on the shoulder. He said, that spirit left me. He said, I'm delivered. Now I want to get saved. So he gave his heart to Jesus. And then he said, now I'd like to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit with tongues. And he got that instantly. Here was an attempt by the devil through a seizure. That spirit, you see, was restless and disturbed and wanted to get out of the meeting. And the devil wanted to disturb it. But instead of that, you see, the devil got defeated. But if you don't know what to do, you're in trouble. You just forget that meeting and come back next week or whatever. And I remember another time in Dallas, Texas, it happened. I was about in the middle of the week. I was teaching all week on faith. And a seizure came right out in the audience. Brother Freeman, Brother Freeman, you know. And I've been teaching them how to minister by faith, how to appropriate, how to deliver themselves and others and all that. Brother Freeman, Brother Freeman. I said, Brother Freeman, what? I said, I've been teaching you all week. And the fellow's writhing there. And that seizure, you know. I said, cast it out. I've been teaching you all week. How? Go ahead and do it yourself. And they did. And it happened. I mean, just like that. Didn't even interrupt us. I don't think I missed a comma or a period anywhere in whatever I was saying. But this is the way he works. He works through others because others may have spirits of infirmity. Another way is directly through demon possession. When we first received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we got our experience in deliverance. Now, God gave us the ministry of deliverance from occult oppression and, of course, other forms of deliverance, but specializing in the occult because Everybody has dabbled in that in some way or another. But anyway, we got some firsthand experience about demon possession. Because when I was teaching one time on faith and healing, I said something to effect. God doesn't need medicine to heal. All he needs is your faith in the blood of Jesus. And the spirit just took complete control. And she began to writhe and hiss like an old serpent. We had the baptism a few months and that was our first experience. So that stopped the meeting. See, we learn better since, but you have to learn some things progressively. And so it took, I think, six of us to hold her down. That's how strong she was, those demon powers. While she cursed and blasphemed and writhed and hissed like a serpent. Well, I only did that once. Any other time, like the epileptic seizure, we didn't stop the meeting. I've had people stand up and the spirit would say, shut up, right in the middle of a meeting you're in. And I'd say the devil, I wouldn't even look. I'd say, you shut up, sit down, be quiet. And then they'd get delivered after the meeting. This particular case I'm thinking of that did. So went through that marathon deliverance one time. Because you see the devil tied up the meeting. He didn't tie it up. He destroyed it. We had no more church that day. Not that morning, that is. And six of us were exhausted. <laughs> so we knew that wasn't the way. You don't hold people down. You just let them writhe if they want to writhe. I mean, that's right. I learned from an old missionary after I received the Holy Spirit. I said, what do you do when they try to disturb your meeting? He said, you just bind them and you don't do anything. If you can help it, you don't even deal with spirits. Because the devil's there to try to disturb the meeting and destroy it. And so a lot of people, you know, want to put on a show of the power of God. And so there's no meeting. And so 1,500 people go home and say, well, saw somebody get delivered. But you can see that anytime you want to. There are a lot of people that need delivered. (laughs) I don't necessarily mean you. Anyway, here's what I'm getting to. This rambling rose of Texas will get to it in a minute. (laughs) Sometime when I'm taping for the radio, I've got to get them all in 13 and a half minutes. And I'll look at the tape counter on the recorder and I've gone over. So I say to myself, the rambling rose of Texas. That's what I call myself. Sometimes. I'm not rambling, but the point is, I want to get to that. All of that was educational. But the point I want to make is, she kept coming back every week and wasn't delivered. See, we only got the demons quiet (laughs) until she came back to her senses and then she went off home. But she would come back every week and, oh, there would be a cloud over the meeting. And you could see the demons looking at you through her eyes. I've dealt with a lot of people who need deliverance, but I've only dealt with three. 
that you wanted to get it over with as quick as possible because the devil was looking at you. Serpent's eyes. I'm not imagining these things. Because the devil has power. He's caused bodies to swell up and people to be able to drink gallons and gallons of water and eat hay like an ox and all of that. Where does that stuff go? Well, demon power. But she would come back every week and she came up to me after that marathon deliverance session, which wasn't really a deliverance, and said, Now, I want to tell you something. You don't want to preach on faith again or divine healing and never sing songs on the blood because this spirit in me, many have tried to cast it out and can't and I just lose control and that demon in me reacts and I just do flip-flops sometimes. That's in the days when they wore dresses. And so she went on to say, you know, she made a spectacle of herself. Well, they still wear dresses in this church, but you know the point I'm trying to make. And so what the devil was trying to do was to implant fear in me, not of his manifestation, but of the consequences. You know, tearing up a meeting. And I'll tell you, when you would come to a place where, you know, the blood be mentioned or divine healing or faith, and there are those eyes looking at you. I mean demon eyes. You just have to overcome. Well, of course, you know me well enough to know I didn't give in to the devil, but the temptation was there to fear the consequences. And so sometimes he works like this, not just through an infirm spirit that manifests like a spirit of epilepsy, but through demon possession. Or he may work again through adversities and accidents and things. What he's trying to do is rob you of either your healing or the healing message. And these are experiences where he's tried to rob the people of the message, like where I was to speak on faith several years ago. And just before I was to go on and speak, we got word the girls had been in a serious accident and were in the hospital. They had found them on the side of the road and hauled them off to the hospital. And by the way, that's how Jerry Irvin got saved. He saw their faith. They were lying there confessing their faith and healing, but they hauled them off to the hospital. And that made an impression on him that three teenagers, you know, didn't want to go to the hospital. But Pam was helpless anyway, broken arm and so forth, crushed elbow. And we got that word. So the devil was trying to destroy that meeting. I had been there before speaking on faith. You could just see all of them like owls on a limb. They had heard about it before we got there. The president of the full gospel chapter told me I had to call the hospital back home. They were sitting there like owls on a limb. What's he going to do? He's a faith teacher. What will he do? What will he do? You could read their thoughts. You didn't have to have word of knowledge. <laughs> so my wife stepped outside in the alley. We agreed they were healed and came right back in. I said, stand up with me and praise God. Not agree with me for anything. Praise God they're healed. And went right on and preached the message. Prayed for the sick. Some got the baptism, whatever. Then we drove back. But you see, what the devil was trying to do through that was to bring confusion in the meeting and in my mind and fear about what's going to happen or what will people think if you don't rush right back. Well, it wouldn't have been faith. When we agreed for their healing, my wife and I, that was it, out in the alley. That was it. I know some of you don't understand that. Some of you come in here as visitors and you're trying to figure out what this faith assembly is all about. Well, it's all about faith. <laughs> the time's going to come when people who cannot receive the total faith message, are going to sit on the sidelines. They may be saved, a lot of them. Sit on the sidelines and watch those of us who endure in the faith do the exploits. He says we're going to do exploits. Amen. Praise God, we're going to do exploits before your eyes. Amen. Hallelujah. He's already doing exploits, but some of you can't see it because they're not big enough. You're going to have to see us curse the fig tree, move the mountain, raise the dead, Open the jails, empty the hospitals before some of you will believe it. But it will be too late then for you to participate in it. Well, the Lord's given me a message for next week entitled, Faith for the 80s. I want to share with you what it's going to take for the 80s. Some didn't make it through the 70s. So he's starting out the 80s wanting us to know what to expect. What's it going to take for this decade? Is this the decade in which... The overcomers will be caught away. Well, it just could be. Just could be. The next century is right around the corner. That's only 20 years away. So it can't be too long before Jesus comes with this latter-day outpouring. We're encouraged to believe it'll be soon. So you see, we've had to learn these things by experience where the devil would try to rob you 
of the faith message, the healing message, because you see, we'd have destroyed all of their faith if we'd have rushed off or gotten all shaky or come in and say, oh, what are we going to do? We're down here serving the Lord, going to preach on faith. And why did he allow this to happen? That's what people ask me. It never occurred to us to ask God that. And I'll tell you, that touched them when we stayed anyway, claimed their healing. We told them what we did and stayed anyway. I think I was back there four or five more times. That's how it impressed that full gospel chapter. In fact, they asked me maybe more than that, but I couldn't keep going to the same place all the time. But anyway, he will try to implant this fear to rob you of your healing. If we had allowed the fear to come in of how serious is it, he could have robbed them of their healing because we agreed on their healing. Just like the pain. We agreed at exactly six o'clock when we got to the hospital and Pam, we took her out the next day by our own wishes and our wishes. It wouldn't be just our wishes. She was of age. But she said at six o'clock, the pain stopped. We agreed at exactly six o'clock when we got to the hospital and Pam, we took her out the next day by our own wishes and our wishes. It wouldn't be just our wishes. She was of age. But she said at six o'clock, the pain stopped. You see, because they wouldn't take any pain medicine or anything. And that's another story in itself. But you can see how sometimes he'll move in with adversity or accident or trouble to try to create confusion in a meeting or in your own mind about, well, does it really work all the time? Or why did this happen? We didn't even raise those questions. Haven't raised them yet. But people raise them. That's why I know that, you know, there are such questions. God, why? Why? It's not God, why? Thank God for the trial, Job said. Hallelujah. Remember his friends. God didn't bless them. Job's friends. That's where we get the term. Even his wife. Curse God and die. You still going to trust God? You lost all your children. He lost his. It wasn't just an accident in a little old car that shouldn't have ever been made. Corvair. They had a lot of accidents with them. Well, another way he works indirectly through skeptics. Oh, does he work through skeptics? You'll be teaching on faith and divine healing. God is blessing. The last person that comes up to you. Well, I see you're not healed. Must be some exceptions to the promises of healing. Physician, heal thyself. Why are you not healed? Well, sometimes I've said, so that you will not look at me and keep your eyes on the Word. Because I've been preaching all week, you know, when you receive your healing, you don't keep running to God or having people pray for you. And manifestation can come later. And how that between 15 and 20 times God has shown the manifestation of my healing from polio that I had, has shown it. To so many people, I've even seen it myself in vision, walking through an airport, better than most of you. I mean, I was really tripping along. (laughs) Where I was going, I don't know, but anyway, they'll come up, physician, heal thyself. Skeptics, how do they get in a meeting like this? I don't know, but they're there. One woman said, when I heard you say there are no exceptions to the promise of God, and that includes divine healing... She said, I almost got up and walked out of your meeting because my husband died of cancer. And if there are no exceptions, that means that he died in vain. He need not have died. I said, that's right. See, she didn't want to admit religious pride. By the way, you've got to choose between religious pride and mature faith. If you're too proud to give up the fact or admit the fact that you were wrong about divine healing or the baptism of the Holy Spirit or speaking in tongues or miracles for today, if you're too proud to admit you've been wrong, then the blessings are not for you. You might be saved. I don't know. I wouldn't give you a lot of assurance at that. She didn't want to admit that they'd been wrong and that her husband died and didn't have to. I said, well, look, for 14 years, I suffered a lot of things at the hands of many physicians and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse (laughs) some of the times, like the woman with the issue of blood. And I said, for 14 years, there it was in the Word. I said, if there's any more light, I want it. And there it was. I didn't see it. I didn't want to see it, I guess. Because I was wrong for 14 years, I'm not going to miss God's blessings now. I said, praise the Lord. I'm going to take His blessings. Forget the pride. Put that under the blood, too. But she would never admit that. Skeptics, right in your meeting. And she, of course, had enough doubt in her to sink a battleship, which is another question in itself. 
I was in a meeting preaching on faith and healing where, and this happened not all the time, but frequent enough that you weren't allowed to forget that there's skeptics out there, even though they're sitting there watching every move and look like they're listening. And these people said, no, we prayed for such and such a person who had diabetes and he believed he was healed and he died believing he was healed. Well, of course, I don't know how you handle things like that, but I have found that people like that will look over 10,000 cases of healing, divine healing, and many of them healed of diabetes, by the way. I've prayed for diabetes and seen it healed. They will pass over 10,000 cases to try to find one that got prayed for or said he believed and didn't get healed. Instead of trying to find out why, they'll find that one case to justify their own unbelief or why they're unwilling to trust God alone when they get sick. That does take faith to be willing to trust God when you've got something serious, you know, like a heart condition, a stroke, strep throat, you name it. It takes faith. And so they're not willing to exercise that kind of faith in God for healing. So in such cases, I found I don't try to argue them into faith because you can't give them five years of theology on healing in five minutes. They're not even prepared to receive it if you could. That's not what they're there for. They're there to show you that there are exceptions because they want to believe that. You know, Paul's thorn, he didn't get healed. They've already made him sick when he didn't say he was and all of that, but... The best thing to do, I found, whether it's the Holy Spirit or healing or whatever, is to give them God's positive promises. It's no longer your responsibility. It's no longer God's. From that point on, it's a question, are they willing to believe God's word or not? Give them the positive promises, then you don't have to argue with them. You don't have to try to convince them. Now, I don't mean to treat this in a contemptible way, like, well, all I have to do is quote you two or three promises and go on and get in my car and go home. From that point on, it's between you and God. That isn't what I'm saying. I'm saying you can't argue people into the faith, especially faith for healing. Oh, no, not faith for healing. You can't argue them in. Give them God's positive promises. Which is all really you can do. And from that point on, the responsibility is off your shoulders and on theirs, whether or not they'll believe God. So he works through skeptics. But often he works through, and you wonder why, but he works through charismatics. Because you've got a lot of charismatics today. It's another one of those terms God has given me, like, you know, giving a testimony and so forth. Or testimony in Pentecostal churches. They'll moan and groan. It's not a testimony. It's a testimony. It's charismatics. Like the faith and presumption teachers. This presumption to believe the written word of God, you know it by rote now, don't you? You have to pray if it be thy will. If it's God's will, he'll give you the faith to believe your healing or to believe that promise or whatever. If he doesn't give you the faith, then go have surgery. Are the faith teachers, that's what they're calling themselves, who today teach us that God now is healing on medicine and through surgery and the doctors. Now, Honestly, I wasn't hearing that from them when I first got the baptism. Some people say, Brother Freeman, you've just come into more light. They were saying that back then. But really, I think the seeds were there. But they weren't saying what they're saying today. So you open the door to a little deception, and then you end up, you know, building hospitals on charismatic campuses and that sort of thing. And so I was speaking in Alabama when a woman came up and said... I heard you say in the message that God doesn't need medicine to heal. All he needs is your faith in the blood of Jesus. You know, the thing that triggered that demon. I say that everywhere I go. And the devil still hates it. But we don't always get a disturbance from a demon. But anyway, she said, I heard you say God doesn't need medicine to heal. All he needs is your faith in the blood atonement of Jesus because healing is provided in the atonement. I said, that's what I said. Because that's what the word of God says. And she said, then do you mean I shouldn't be taking my medicine? Well, I said, I didn't say that. I never, ever tell anybody not to take medicine, not to go to a doctor, not to go to the hospital. I said, God doesn't need those things. See, that's what I said. Let's stay with what I said, because that's what God's Word said. How can you be healed by prayer when you're on pills? You ought to know that. So, charismatics who run to the doctors themselves. They say God heals on medicine and through the doctors. They ought to know because that's where they go. Every time they have a problem, that's where they go. One in his book, call the doctors and call the elders. Well, he doesn't even say call the elders. Call the doctors and then pray. But that isn't the divine order in James 5. 
Well, all of these are ways that the devil can steal your healing. I've given you two things. First of all, ground your faith in the Word of God on divine healing and not man's Word on divine sickness. That is the theological position of the Protestant Catholic Church of our day, divine sickness. That can't even be debated. Then secondly, we said, guard your mind against the way Satan works. And all of these ways we've given you, now we come to a third way to keep the devil from stealing your healing. And that is... You need to guard yourself against special personal attacks from the enemy. Now, this is an area where we've not dealt before. And I think it needs to be pointed out. You need to guard yourself, especially at certain times, against special personal attacks from the enemy. The principle here is Luke 12.39, if you want to turn there. In Luke 12.39, we have the principle that we want to establish this fact on. Where we're told by Jesus, if the owner of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken into. You can apply the principles of the word of God concerning faith and deliverance and everything to all the situations you'll run into. If you apply that principle to what we're talking about, guarding yourself against special times of personal attack from the enemy. The principle is, if you know the time he's going to attack, you'll be on guard. See, if we knew the time when Satan would come and try to creep in, he's talking about creeping into a house like a thief and stealing. We're talking about stealing healing. If you knew the time the devil would try to creep into your mind when you're going through a trial or your child or your loved one or somebody in the church... Creep in your mind and plant those lies and deceptions and fears and doubts and all of that. Then you'd be on guard. Or when he would try to assault your body, say with symptoms and pains, try to put something on you, you'd be on your guard. You wouldn't allow it. But you see, Jesus says here, you don't always know. The thief doesn't come every day, thank God. But there's special times he comes. But if you knew the hour, you'd be on guard. That's what he said. Well, certainly I would. I wouldn't shoot them, but I wouldn't invite them in either. I'd let them know I'm there, even if I barked like a dog or whatever. (laughs) And as I said, I lock my doors. I don't make it easy for them. They find a locked door, they've come in the window. So, you know, you can't keep them out unless you build a bomb shelter underground, and then they'll tunnel through (laughs) with a bulldozer or something. But anyway, the principle is, if you knew the hour, the enemy would come in. Creep in with these lies and deceptions and fears. And you can fear. Listen, I've gone through some trials where you're tempted to fear. I don't and haven't. I said tempted because of the seriousness of it. The nature of it. And you just go right on confessing that word and holding to it. But you see, if you knew the hour he's going to come, you'd be especially prepared. You'd be up at dawn in the word of God. Well, he's going to come at 8 o'clock today. The Lord has shown me that. But you don't know. And in a dream the Lord gave me, I was sitting at his feet like Mary, asking him questions and listening to him. One had to do with my ministry in the future. But one that I want to share with you, I've shared before concerning healing, I said, Lord, why is it sometimes when the devil puts symptoms on you or tries to, that I can rebuke those symptoms and they go in a matter of minutes? You can say immediately. And then there have been times when he would put something on you and with the same faith, you would battle that, you know. And sometimes it would be days, a trial of your faith for days. I said, why is it? Sometimes he goes right away and sometimes you just have to battle a warfare. He said, sometimes Satan fights harder. That's all he said. In fact, I appreciated those few words. What are we saying to guard yourself against special times of attack? He said, sometimes Satan fights harder. Did you notice he didn't say when he was going to do it? If he had wanted me or you to know the when, he would have told us. But Luke twelve thirty nine says you don't always know. Why? Because you'd grow careless between the assaults and attacks. If he told you when each time, you knew he would always warn you ahead. He wants you to be on your guard 24 hours a day. So he won't steal your healing or your faith for it, which is the same thing. 
No, you don't know. If he wanted us to know, he would have told us. He just said, sometimes. <laughs> like the thief, sometimes. Nothing you can do to keep them out if they want in. They can even come down a chimney as big as ours. You know what I mean? You can't keep thieves out. What I'm saying is, here the whole sentence, you can't keep thieves out. The only way that they can be kept out, the Lord will keep them out. So that's what we believe for. You can't keep them out. Tell me how. Well, anyway. Now, having said that, that he doesn't want us to know the when. He wants us to be on guard against the assaults of the enemy all the time. Yet there are times when you can have a pretty good indication when he might try to attack you in a special way. And the first is the obvious one. That is when you are in disobedience, backslidden. You're not walking in the light you've got because the principle here is whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. And one of the ways he chastens, and anybody who is his child, this isn't news to them, one of the ways he chastens is to allow the devil to put on that individual sickness or infirmity. Now, God doesn't make you sick, but in chastisement, if he can't get your attention any other way, this is one of the ways. That's Hebrews 12, among other passages. That's 1 Corinthians 5 where Satan was allowed to afflict that Christian in that church because he was living in sin until he woke up. So you can almost expect some sort of an attack, whether it's physical or financial or domestic, missing some blessing. There are other ways he can chasten, but often it's physical chastisement. If you are not walking in the light you get in this church, if you're out of fellowship with the Lord in sin or disobedience, you can almost mark it down on the wall that the Lord will be talking to you with a paddle before long. Now, if you're his child, I know of one case where I don't know when the person ever had any chastisement or any real problems. His greatest problem is not getting his way. I mean, the only trial he's ever had is not to get his way about something. Well, so what does that say? If the Lord chastens those whom he loves and he's never had it or never any real trial. What's everyone so quiet about? I'm not talking about you. <laughs> because I assume you've had a little of that divine discipline. It's good for you. You don't need to get it, but you're going to get it. But what I'm saying, one of the times you can just pretty well expect it is you better get back in fellowship because if you're not walking in the light you've got, that'll be one of the times the devil will be knocking on your door and God will allow it because the Word of God says he does. And another time when you want to be careful and on your guard is when you are at the peak of some spiritual mountaintop experience. You have to watch because the devil sometimes tries to creep up behind and just push you over. And then you're no longer on the mountaintop, you're over the cliff. I've been in those meetings where maybe I'm teaching on Mark 11:24. Everyone in this church should know Mark 11:24. What things soever you desire when you pray, believe you receive them, you'll have them. You've spent an hour and a half teaching on. I mean an hour and a half, say, teaching on Mark 11:24. That if you pray 10 times for the same promise, you've prayed 9 times in unbelief. Because he said when you pray, believe you have received, then why would you be praying twice if you believe you have received when you pray? He said you'll have it. He said in Matthew 6, don't use vain repetitions as the heathen do. They think they're heard for they're much praying. Now we're talking about claiming the promises of God. We don't want to digress into all the things, try to satisfy everybody that's never heard it all and not going to listen to the hundreds of tapes we've got. Certainly there are other ways to pray. Intercession should be made repeatedly for men in authority and that sort of thing. We're talking about claiming the promises. He says, don't use vain repetitions. Your father knows what you need before you ask. Why pray? To release your faith. You don't supply him with information. He knows your needs before you pray. You're not saying, God, here are my needs. That's why it's always amusing to me for people to get out on the knees, thump the chair in the floor and yell and scream and plead with God and go through all the details that God already knows. They think that's sincerity and he'll hear them for their much speaking. No, get to the point. Claim what you're believing. Then if you want to spend an hour praising God and not weeping and wailing, trying to get God's ear, then that's all right. So you go through that for an hour and a half. You give yourself as an example how that 14 years ago I was healed. And 15 to 20 times that healing, the manifestation has been shown supernaturally. 
I mean, to people that you've never heard of, you go over here, say, Brother, I saw in a vision the manifestation of your healing. One woman said, I saw it. And when it was manifested, the body of Christ somehow is going to enter into it. You know, they will reap the benefits too. And that sort of thing. And you go through all that and you no sooner get done. And they come rushing up. Do you know, legs are growing out today. Let's pray for your leg. I say, yes, I know it because I prayed for a lot of people. What's that got to do with an hour and a half? I received my healing 14 years ago. If I let you pray for me, then I don't believe I was healed back then. What they don't know, it isn't a question of a leg growing out. What you don't know, you wouldn't believe until maybe sometime we would show you the pictures after it's manifested. Just to stand up here is a miracle. Just to walk is a miracle. I've been run over by heavy trucks. I've had polio. I'll tell you, friends, it's a miracle. And you know, when I stand up here two or three hours counseling people, God gives me the grace. You notice I don't sit down. I might start sitting down because some people who've got manifestations or don't need one on their legs sit down. I thought sometimes of doing that, but that would only encourage a bigger line. Well, he's set for the night. (laughs) And of course, in this church, we want to counsel with those who really need help, but not people who are up and down every week concerning their salvation or whatever. You know, wanting to say, well, I'm taking a vacation. Just wanted you to know. Well, praise the Lord. That just makes the line longer. Write me a little card from where you're going and say, wish you were here or something. That'll shorten these lines. So you preach your heart out on Mark eleven twenty four and show them in every way you can how that people receive their healing manifestation later. Give them illustration after illustration. And there's the devil getting ready to push you off because the temptation is to respond to them. Weren't you here tonight? You know, they don't act like it hour and a half and so I did that and got a woman crying the first time I did it and I saw that's not the way the Lord showed me just respond in love say no thank you I know you mean well but as I said in the message I got my healing whether it was nine years ago at those times that they would try that ten years ago twelve years ago and if I let you pray for me I don't believe it was healed then thank you anyway I know you mean well you know just thank them And I found out it does wonders for me. It doesn't change them. They didn't hear the message. I summarize it in a sentence. But the temptation, you just can't believe that people will do what they do. And you have to learn to respond in love, patient love. You have to learn that. You're not born that way. Well, you're born again. Well, that's right. Then why do we have to... Keep teaching on holiness and all of these other things if everybody's just automatically perfect as soon as they get the new birth. Well, if you've ever read the New Testament, you know most of the letters are correcting some of the mistakes they made with their new birth, that is. Oh, did the devil push me over, you see? I was on that mountaintop experience. Let us pray for you. Well, I said, you haven't heard a word I've said. I should have never said that. But you know, I just boggles your mind that they can sit for an hour and a half and all you've said that a child could understand it. And then they want to pray for you because they've been in a meeting, they've just gotten the baptism, they saw somebody's legs grow out. Well, I said, I've prayed for people, their legs grow out. What's that got to do with the message tonight? An hour and a half. Well, some of you have never experienced that, so you wouldn't know what the temptation is to lose your mountaintop. You know, after healings and miracles... Sometimes the last person will say, I don't believe a word you've said. Teach in a meeting and the last person shake your hand and big smile on his face and then take his hand away and said, 90% of what you said is wrong. (laughs) Well, he ought to know. He must have been God's authority to get everybody straightened up. But anyway... What he said about, I said, you're 110% wrong. Because he was talking about the Florida Four trying to defend them and their shepherdship cult. But anyway, that sort of thing. And you have to watch that you don't let them, you know, push you off the mountain. And then again, you have to be on guard against maybe some special attack when the devil knows, and he knows some things, that you're going to move into his territory and deliver some of his captives with your faith testimony or message. Concerning healing and faith. Now, I'm not saying you have to fear an attack. I'm saying you don't want to be careless because Jesus said sometimes he fights harder. 
That's what he said. That's what he says here. If you knew the time that the enemy would creep in, you would guard your house. In this case, your mind and your body. But you don't know. So it isn't a question of being afraid. That's why God sets teachers in the church. That's why we labor. It's so some of you won't do what you do. And some of you do it anyway. No, this isn't to make you afraid. Well, I'm going in a special meeting. I'm going to Switzerland or Germany or Mexico. And now I wonder, whoo, what may happen? No, God doesn't warn you and admonish you to put fear in your heart, but faith. To be on your guard. Yes, the first faith meeting I had, I told you about it, the devil put everything he could on me. It wasn't just symptoms. I had the Hong Kong flu. My first faith meeting, and it was a good one. I mean, it was a good one. Cancers healed. People baptized in the Spirit in a Pentecostal church. He even had the pastor jumping. He said, well, look at that. The pastor got up and said, it's proof that you can receive the Holy Spirit by faith. You don't have to tarry and seek. See, that's the way the Pentecostals do it. Another Pentecostal church, he says, I don't understand it. People all week have been receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and you don't say anything to them, but you or your wife, a little something in their ear. We've been taught to teach them to seek and tarry. Well, I said, why argue with the method, you know, if it works? And so it was one of our best meetings. It was my first one, but I mean, it was still one of the best. But you see, I had that battle. And I was in a tent meeting once for two weeks where I had, well, actually the same thing again. It was years apart, but I had it again. And a big fan in back of me blowing in that tent. And the devil said, you've not only got the flu, but you'll end up with pneumonia. And I was so weak, I actually fell off the chair and the Lord caught me. You know, I was halfway down to the floor and I was just there by faith. I had no more voice. I had to stand with my mouth right against the mic. One time I had my eyes closed and came down on it. <laughs> A little embarrassing, but that's all the voice I had. And yet it was one of the best meetings. They sat on the edge of their seats to listen. They didn't know I was going through a trial. The only people who knew it, myself, God, the devil, and my wife, she knew something was going on. She just knew because I never talk about trials. One day she laid her hand on my head and it was about 110, she thought. So she knew I was battling something. But you see, when he sees you moving into his territory, you don't need to be afraid of that. But be careful. You're going to release his captives. Don't get careless. Don't say, well, I'm going to go preach faith and healing. And I believe in the blood atonement. I have faith and God will take care of me. That's carelessness. The Bible shows like Ephesians 6, we're in a spiritual warfare. We need to put on the whole armor of God. It's like Brother Stan Hill over there in Switzerland where the enemy put that stroke on him, you see. So what did he do? He knew what the devil was trying to do to destroy the faith of those people. They're just getting into faith, you see, over there. They haven't had it for years like you. And so what he began to do is confess the word he was preaching. In a matter of a few days, he's back preaching to them to be a living example of what faith will do. And he said to me, it never occurred to me to call the doctor run the hospital. He just knew he was in a warfare and he started confessing the word. But you see, why didn't he suffer that over here? So it's not to minister fear if you're going out in some special way to witness or minister. Be on your guard. Be careful. Because Jesus said to me in this dream, sometimes he fights harder. He says here in the word, if you knew the when, you'd be on guard. He wants you to be on guard. Don't take for granted because you're going to go share this faith message with somebody off in some foreign land. You know that, well, God will take care of me. It's good to believe, Psalm 91, that he will take care of you. But don't be careless. Don't be presumptuous. Don't just rest in your past faith experiences. Every day is a new day. Father, in Jesus' name, now as we prepare for the communion, the koinonia, the fellowship of the saints, sharing the bread and cup, which reminds us of the full atonement that Jesus purchased for us, redemption of the whole man, Body, mind, soul, and spirit, we pray that these words of admonishment and encouragement of the truth of divine healing will quicken faith in hearts to reach out and receive their healing, even tonight, and even believe that manifestations of healings can come as we partake. Lord, we know that we have the healing of eyesights and fillings 
for teeth and restoration of teeth. Healings of weaknesses and infirmities that have not been manifested. We have those by faith. And Father, it's with expectation that as we look to the cross and the full work of redemption done there, that this can be one of the times for manifestation. We just know it is going to happen because the healing was received when we believed. And we do all of this, we've said all of this, and now we participate together for the glory of the Father through the Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Would the men who are going to help, you know what to do, take care of it. You might want to turn to 1 Corinthians 11. We'll be reading from there. Now, as you're beginning to pass out, I'd like to just make one observation and remark. We neither invite you nor forbid you to partake. If you're a child of God, it's between you and the Lord. You know the word of God teaches you're not to partake unworthily. Now, he didn't say unworthy because who's worthy? But unworthily, you're not in fellowship with God. You're in criticism of this body. You're a visitor who has come to spy out the land. We don't know that those things exist. They have. We would invite you not to partake. But only you can make the decision. Because we do not feel that that's our prerogative, our responsibility, unless we know a particular case. So let each man, Paul said, judge himself and let him partake. Praise the Lord. Is anyone who hasn't been served who wishes to be? So I was sitting there. I kept seeing this ram. I asked the Lord what it meant. He gave me Genesis 22, the sacrifice of Isaac. Isaac, after he saw his father build the altar, gather the wood. He said, my father... Here am I, my son. He said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself a lamb for the burnt offering. And remember the words of John in chapter 1, where 
When he saw Jesus, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. And of course, that is the gospel, the gospel of the redemption of us from the penalty, the consequence of sin. And Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 11, after the sacrifice has been made, he said, I receive from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And Father, as we partake now of the bread which signifies the offering up of the body of Jesus on the cross. And thank God it was not his spirit that died. But again, we see from this passage the offering of his body to die in our place, suffering the punishment of our guilt. Our hearts are eternally grateful. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Then we read, after the same manner also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he come. And Father, as we partake of the cup, we're reminded of the story in the Gospels of the shed blood of Jesus. We believe that this symbolizes that pure, spotless, blameless blood that he offered to you on our behalf to cover our sins. We thank you that he was a sin offering and not sin. And that he does redeem us because just as he died, he said to the thief today, I will be in paradise and you with me. He said, it is finished. And he said, Father, into thy hands, not the devil's as is being taught today, but into thy hands I commend my spirit. We thank you for the truth of that. We thank you that we can believe the truth of the atonement and not the error. And this blood as we partake, Of this cup, this blood, which was pure and spotless, we believe that it remained that way. We thank you for that revelation in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's just stand and thank God for His Word. Lord, we thank you for your pure Word. The shed blood of Jesus, the offering of his body on the tree. Father, we thank you for Jesus. Jesus, we thank you for dying. Holy Spirit, we thank you for applying the atonement. We thank you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord God. Hallelujah. Blessed be the Lord. We praise you for your mercy, your grace, for the atonement, for the blood. Praise the name of the Lord. Worship and honor, blessing, power, dominion belong to you, to the Lamb of God, to the Father who gives it. Hallelujah. Praise be the Lord. Praise be the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your message. Thank you for your message. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You know, the Lord gave me that prayer. And 
The thought occurred to me, what do these people who tell us his blood became impure and that his spirit went under the control of Satan, that Satan actually possessed him for three days, that he redeemed us in hell instead of at the cross. What do they do at communion time? Which stage of the blood that this represents are they partaking of? I'll tell you. Thank God that I can believe what the Bible says. Thank God I don't have a struggle. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank God I can believe. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You ought to remind yourself of that. Thank God I can believe in divine healing. Thank God I can believe in the biblical view of the atonement. Thank God I can believe in the baptism and speaking in tongues. Because there's some people, I don't know, they must not be able to believe it. I just thank God I don't have to struggle with these things. Father, we ask you now to dismiss us with your love. Watch over us. Protect us. Deliver us. Continue to be merciful to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. For a complete list of Dr. Freeman's tapes, books, and tracks, write to Faith Ministries, Post Office Box 1156, Warsaw, Indiana, 46580.